Hi folks, how do we create chamfers in Fusion 360 that move across multiple surfaces at different angles and create those chamfers so that they both look good and give us a good clean surface to work off of to create our cam tool pass? This kicked our butt, but we figured it out with some help. Let's walk through that process. So if we use the chamfer tool, we will get a chamfer, but it's not what we want as this chamfer moves along multiple different edges at different planes or, or fall lines or surfaces here. Now, if you're just looking for a small edge break, perhaps it's okay, but when you're trying to design that perfect aesthetic part or you want a good clean surface for our tool pass, creating a pipe can help solve this issue. So let's start by creating a hole that moves across a compound surface that has a fillet on it. So with this relatively simple shape like this, chamfer is probably still going to work. And if that solves the task at hand for you, by all means proceed. But here's the way of creating a slightly cleaner surface that will have some downstream benefits with the toolpath. S for the keyboard shortcut pop-up pipe. We'll choose the first pipe option in the solid modeling workspace. We'll pick our edge and because we had chain selection checked, it usually does quite a good job at picking the correct chain and we'll add a 30,000th pipe to our part. So what we now have is just that, a pipe that cuts along the profile of that chamfer, which is not what we want. The key now is to hop into the surface workspace. And it's a little bit misleading because you're just toggling the ribbon toolbar, but it, there's actually more happening behind the scenes when you do this because what we're gonna do is select the bottom half of that pipe and hit delete. And you'll notice there's a tan background right now. If we did that same delete staying in the model space, it would be something that Fusion is quite good at, which is a destructive edit or solid modeling editing, which can be really helpful. It basically just takes away the pipe that we just made, but that's not what we want to do here. If you're new to the surface workspace, we call it patch sometimes. You may think, what is going on? Well, take a look. If we hop into inspect section analysis and we pick that plane and scoot that back, we can now slice our part. And what we can see is because we're in the surface workspace, we're working with surfaces or patches. So these are thinless surfaces that just represent the outside extents of this piece of geometry. These don't have any thickness. They have to be graphically represented by something, but they're sort of nothing. So what we did when we deleted the bottom half of that pipe is we exposed the inside cavity of this, which shows that it's effectively hollow. Or if you've heard the term watertight model, we don't have a watertight model right now because if you turn off our section analysis, you can see if we filled this thing up with water, it would be leaking out of this cavity. So what we do now is S to bring up our shortcut loft, and we'll do the second loft option, which is a surfacing loft. We'll start with this edge here. And what we want to try to do is match the two lofts. So in this case, the outside one, and I'll pick the inside one click OK. And we're going to go along and do this. You might, depending on the geometry, you might be able to get by with one selection around the outside and one on the inside, but I've found that it's often a bit difficult and easier to just do this along as we go. And sure enough, I think I just made a small mistake, which is I left a sliver out. It's easy to catch that this way, though. And if we go back to our second loft, edit it, I can hold down the control key and just pick that last chain that I missed. So what we're doing in the surface workspace here is we're lofting a surface from one edge to the other. Continue that around. And this time I gotta make sure I pick that edge there. And we'll have one more to do. If you're thinking that this is a lot of work, you wouldn't be totally wrong. It does take some more work, but for product design or where you really care about the surfacing toolpaths, it can be well worth it. So now we have a cleaner surface, almost done. The problem is if we turn our section analysis back on, we have a model that is watertight, but not really, because if we hop back into the solid workspace and we delete it now, something's wrong. It's not a B rep or boundary rep or quote unquote true solid model. This object here is not solid. Quick fix though is to modify stitch, join surfaces to make a single surface body or solid body. And what's cool is we do that subject to a tolerance. Now we just made all this geometry, so the tolerancing should be quite good. But if you ever downloaded models off the internet, things like thingy verses or STL files that are floating around, sometimes the build quality of those models can really range. And so stitching it subject to this tolerance can really help. Drag a box or everything, click okay. 
So now in the solid model workspace, if we start deleting surfaces, Fusion will act like we normally expect it to, which is direct modeling to delete this chamfered edge and go ironically back to the very beginning. So now the question is, what's the best tool path to move along and surface this chamfer? First though, a trick, right click, copy, and then right click, paste, we're duplicating our body. And I'm gonna rename body eight to stock body. We'll turn off the visibility of body seven so that it's clear that we're working on this stock body. And I'm actually gonna make use of Fusion's ability to do direct modeling by deleting the chamfer we just made, which gives us that sharp edge. And this trick is helpful because when we do our cam simulation, all I wanna do right now is focus on surfacing this toolpath, and I wanna to see the simulation of that. So when we create our setup, the body is body seven. I really wish Fusion would change this body nomenclature here to represent what it is in the design tree. Just seems like that would be such a helpful tool. But then under stock, we'll change the mode to be from solid, and that will let us pick the stock body. And now when we do a simulation, we don't need to create roughing tool paths to rough out this whole part. We can start immediately from, from this to this. We've got a couple different toolpath examples. I'm gonna paste these in, and we'll make this file available to download over on the NYC CNC website. The first toolpath is blend. When we read the pop-up menu, these are usually quite helpful. It's a finishing strategy for shallow areas between contours with a consistent direction. It doesn't necessarily read like it's the best option, but if we look at the input drivers for this toolpath, we have surfaces and curves. It is kind of the perfect toolpath. So for surfaces, we want to pick along the edges. And then for curves, we'll pick the outside curve and the inside curve. We have a tooth out step over. What I like about this toolpath is it looks good. It's relatively even step overs. It seems to flow nice. It looks like a toolpath that would run fairly well on a machine. But I want to look at how the cutting tool moves along that surface. We can simulate it from here. But oftentimes with complex geometry, you'll have things that are in the way. It's a great time to use section view. Inspect section analysis. The problem is I don't have a face that offers the plane that I want to section this part at. So we'll first hop back into design, construct plane at angle, and I'll pick this, and I can adjust that to be 45 degrees. And what we can now do, <coughs> Back in the cam workspace is section analysis. Pick this and we can drag this back. We can section along this part. This will let us better see from a side profile how the cutting tool is interacting with that face. We can choose look at and pick that face to look at it head on. And toggling the analysis off can be helpful, but also shows how it occludes the view of what you want to see. But even better, we'll be using the cam simulation, which is nice because, again, we don't have to do all that roughing strategy. We're actually going to turn off the body seven, which is our actual part. So we've got it in comparison mode with a three thou tolerance. So the blue is extra stock. And as we start to play, you can see it start machining that away. Still got a little bit of blue left. We'll drive that tolerance down. And you can use this tolerance as a kind of hack to see, you know, that looks like it may be a lot of material, but if we change the tolerance from two to three thou, you can see it goes away. And most of it's even gone away at two thousandths of an inch. This is about 0 0.05 millimeters. So it's not that it doesn't matter. It may matter for your application or your part, but generally speaking, it's a relatively small amount of material. After blend, scallop is your best option. Very simple tool path to program. We pick the two edges of our chamfer in no particular order. The settings will matter. So I absolutely recommend downloading the file if you're trying to learn or experiment with this. We have an additional offset that's negative, two tenths of an inch. And that negative amount is slightly more than the positive tolerance in the passes tab. And this has to do with how the cam engine tessellates the model or turns the solid model somewhat ironically back into an STL file in the background and does so subject to a tolerance, we need to make sure we stay inside the maximum range of what that tolerance may be so that the toolpath doesn't 
water line over our part like you see here. So simply changing that positive two tenths back to the correct negative two tenths will keep it inside of the part. The problem with scallop though is, and the reason I like blend a little bit better, is that scallop toolpath will start on the outside and it will collapse that toolpath in subject to our limit. And so you see you get slightly varying widths of the toolpath. Now I'm going to guess you're not going to see this on a part that's this small, but it's an area where blend just does a better job. And one of the nice things is you can see it in the actual toolpath simulation. You can have confidence that this is going to look better than this before you even get out to the machine. Trace does not work, and I wish it did, but I think it's worth showing why it doesn't. I've switched back to the pre-chamfered model, and the thought is, can we use 2D Trace, which can move along varying Z heights, with a ball nose end mill to machine this part? And you'll quickly see that it handles the areas of low slope quite well, but as soon as we move up to the areas of high slope, you can see it's starting to gouge into our model. And then finally, Morph doesn't work here, but it's a toolpath that I think is worth mentioning because it's just so cool. If you look at the description, to finishing strategy, to finish areas between selected contours with a consistent cutting direction. This is a totally different part than our surfaced chamfer, but, but what Morph does is it takes two curves and it creates toolpaths that morph from this shape to that shape as it moves across your step over. So even though this is a totally different part, the idea that we want to be able to pick one chain and morph it to the other chain is what made me think this toolpath could be a decent option. It gets close, but I think some of the issues have to do with the fact that morph still relies on a projection view, and projection views are where you're looking at a cam toolpath from the top down. Many toolpaths start to fail because this chamfer looks perfectly normal from a top-down view, but it's when we start to rotate the part, we realize that this section is nearly vertical and this section is nearly flat. Otherwise, folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.